I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but one thing I've realized recently is that we face a lot of decisions in life but most of our time and energy is not spent making decisions. Most of our time and energy is spent managing those decisions. We spend very little time and energy actually making the decision. We spend most of our time and energy with the impact of those decisions. For example, you'll decide where to go to college over the course of maybe a few months, but you'll spend four years attending that college. Four years for most of you, of course. You can get engaged in a night but you will spend decades married. You can conceive a baby in a moment, but we'll spend a lifetime with that child. Most of our time is spent managing decisions, not making decisions. And a lot of people today feel overwhelmed by decisions, so they decide to put off decisions, but the reality is you make decisions by indecision. The choice to not make a decision is itself, in itself a decision by indecision. So when you don't decide now to get in shape, it's actually a decision to be overweight. When you don't decide who to ask out, it's a decision to be single. When you don't decide where to vacation, it's a decision to stay home. I like the Teddy Roosevelt quote. He said, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. So even when we put off decisions, we're actually making decisions by indecision and then we spend most of our time managing that decision. That's how your life is. That's how your spiritual life is. Some of you have made a decision to set up online giving. You spend your energy now just managing that decision. Some of you have made a decision to pursue purity. Now you just manage that decision. Some of you made a decision to repent and be baptized. Now you just manage that decision. And this is Commitment Weekend for our greater campaign. Today is a moment of decision. So I want to remind you real quick where we've been in this series. We start off by saying that we're a church for people on the fringes. The biggest accusation they lobbed against Jesus in his day is why do you hang out with them? Why do you hang out with people like that? If you claim to be God, you shouldn't be around them. And Jesus' response was, I came for them. I came for people like that. So we said, we are that church. We are that church that looks for people like them. We are that church for people on the fringes. We are that church for people like me. We talked about legacy, that we're a part of this great legacy called the church. So we will together storm the gates of hell to rescue people. And we don't care if all we've got is a bunch of tiny little squirt guns. We're going to storm hell because if we all grab what little we've got and throw it at the mission of the Jesus, we're going to save some people. We learned that in our lives we get a few moments that are an opportunity for extravagance, where we can throw everything we've got at God's mission, even though other people will think we're crazy. And the reason we're doing all this is so Jesus can bring peace in the pain. Last week, we heard the story of Sean and Rachel. Everywhere we look, there's pain. And the only thing that's going to get people through that is the peace that only Jesus brings. Today, the greater series is culminating with a moment of decision. At the end of our service, we're going to turn in the commitment cards of what we're going to give to this campaign. Now, let me say up front, if you're a first-time guest today, I have no idea why your friend brought you today, but we are glad you're here. I mean, really, right? Welcome to church. We're all giving a bunch of money away. Um, we're glad you're here. I want to tell you two things. One is we have a free T-shirt for you, and we want you to meet some of our best people at the Black Tent after service. And the second thing is we want you today to understand the gospel. We want to understand that Jesus and only Jesus can give you grace that you can receive by faith and that will lead to freedom. I'm going to explain that in more detail as we go, but your moment of decision, first time guess, is just simply a decision to come back. For everybody, everybody else, today's a moment of decision financially and to put off a decision is to make a decision. So I know you've been thinking, I know you've been praying but I want to walk you through a scripture and talk to you for a few minutes before you make your final commitment. We're going to read from Romans chapter 5. It was written by the Apostle Paul. Paul's job used to be to kill Christians. That's what he did. But he has a dramatic encounter with Jesus. He gives his life to Jesus and spends the rest of his life starting churches and writing letters to those churches, which we, which we now have preserved as part of our New Testament of the Bible. And that's what we're going to read from today. Romans 5, 8, maybe my favorite verse in all scripture, says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This 
is grace. This is the gospel. This verse is the best news you will ever hear. So let me break it down. It calls you a sinner. That means you have messed up. You cannot keep your own standard, let alone God's standard. And you know this is true. Nobody has to tell you don't cheat. Nobody has to tell you don't lie or steal. Those things are just known universally in every country and every, every culture. Scripture says it's God's law in our hearts. But it says he sent Christ. Meaning God looked at you while you were doing the worst thing you'd ever do and said, I'm going to send my son to die for that. I'm going to send my son to die for her. I'm going to send my son to die for him. Christ means Savior, meaning simply Jesus was God in flesh. He experienced every trial of humanity, loneliness, temptation, laziness. He faced it all, but he was perfect. So when it says he died for us, it simply means he took your place. Sin results in death. And there are a lot of things wrong in our world, but death is the ultimate evil to overcome. And death is the result of sin in our world. Now, the reason we believe Romans 5.8 is because Jesus rose on the third day. He didn't just die for you. He defeated death, meaning you can have hope. See, whatever pain in you have in your life, the one who conquered death holds you in his hand so you know he'll redeem it one day. The resurrection means the illness isn't the end of the story because whether it ends in death or life, in Jesus, you have eternal life. The resurrection means that whether you're single or married or in a dysfunctional relationship, you're never alone. The resurrection means that even when I doubt what little faith I have is enough because it's faith in Jesus. The resurrection means that if I struggle with the same sin for years, if I destroy my marriage, if I mess up my kids, if I alienate my friends, if I lose my job, God's love for me does not change. The resurrection means even though I have let others down, even though I've let myself down, I still have something worth living for. The resurrection means no matter what you're facing through Jesus, you have hope. See, the first phrase says, God showed his great love for us. And this sums up everything we need to know. Yes, you've messed up. And your mess is only going to end one way, which is death. But there is a God who loves you and he sent his son to die for you. It is a free gift. So all you have to do is accept it. You say, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. I want grace. I want endless second chances. I want you to lead me every day going forward. And for you who have not done that, the most important thing that could happen today is not you writing a check for a million dollars to this campaign. It is you checking the baptism box in your connection card to let Jesus know, I am am yours. And the reason you do that is because God loves you. See, love necessitates action. For God, for God Romans 5, 8, it meant sending his son. For us, love means carrying on his mission. And part of that means as a church, us moving to a better, bigger facility so we can let more people know God loves you. A question I've got about our new building a couple times is, why are we making it over a 1,000 seats? That sounds pretty intimidating. And I will be the first to say, listen, if we lose the part of our DNA that makes us a place where people feel welcome and needed and known, then we've lost a critical part of who we are. And we cannot lose that. We are already putting things in place that will not lose that. But when I get asked the question, why are we getting 1,000 seats? Here's my answer. Let's imagine that you can take a trip back in time and you find yourself in Southampton, England in April 1912. You're trying to get your bearings. You find a newspaper and the headline says, Titanic set to take maiden voyage today. And you realize you're in the city where it's leaving from. What would you do? If you're a caring person at all, you are going to run down to the docks where people are getting ready to board and you're going to do everything in your power to let them not get on that ship because you know the ship's going down. You would encourage them or challenge them or do whatever it took to say, don't get on board, over 1,500 people are going to die. What would they do? They'd laugh in your face. They'd say, you're crazy. This ship's unsinkable. Even God himself couldn't sink this ship and they'd get on board. If you're a caring person, what would you do? Go home? No. You get a boat and follow after the Titanic so when it goes down, you could save some people. So here's my question. How big a boat would you get? You wouldn't get one that could seat two people. 
You wouldn't get a little boat that had nine seats on it. You wouldn't even get a houseboat that sat ten. What, what would you do? You'd get every penny you had. You'd get every ounce of credit available to you. And you'd get the biggest boat you could possibly find. And you'd chase after that so you could save as many people as you possibly could with as many seats as you could possibly get. So when people ask me, why are we building over a thousand seats in our new building? My answer is, because we can't fit anymore. Because we believe God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And the thing I love about this church is for all nine and a half years of its existence, we don't care about our personal needs or desires. What we care about is if it's a tool we can use to let as many people as possible know endless second chances are real. See, Romans 5.8 is why we follow Jesus. It is why the church exists. And two sentences earlier, Paul wrote about God's moment of decision. Here's what it says. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. I like that phrase, while we were utterly helpless. One translation says, when we were powerless. Kind of the same thing. Have you ever felt powerless? You ever felt Utterly helpless. Several years ago, before we had kids, uh, we used a spare bedroom in our house as a weight room for me. And that's how I became the hulking mass of a man standing before you today. <laughs> but I would lift weights at night while my wife was at grad school. And there was one particular evening where she was at grad school. And the last exercise of the night I was doing was a bench press. And I was benching probably a whopping total of 120 pounds. And I was doing my reps and feeling good and had some music going. The adrenaline was going. So I'd reached the end. But I thought, you know what? I think I can do one more rep here. So I brought the bench press down without a spotter, keep in mind. I started to push it up. And then it started to come back down. <laughs> and I started to push it up again. And then it started to came, come back down until it was resting on my sternum. And I thought, this is not going to end well. Fortunately, I had foreseen the possibility of this situation, so I hadn't put the clips on the end of it, and I kind of used all the might I had left to kind of roll this way on the bench. All the weights fell off that way. Then it flipped over this way. They all came crashing out this way. sounded like there was going to be a hole in the floor by the time I was done. And in that moment, I recognized this is what it feels like to be utterly powerless. This is what it feels like to be utterly helpless. See, it is good news that when we were utterly helpless against sin. See, I don't know if you've ever felt crushed by weights, but I guarantee you felt crushed by sin before. When you've been in a situation where you realized, I can't do this. And at just the right time, Christ came. See, look at that phrase. It says, at just the right time. Meaning, just when you were getting crushed, just when you needed it, God sent his son and Jesus faced a moment of decision where he decided, I'm going to go through with this. I'm going to the cross so he could die for you. I love that phrase at just the right time. I remember when my brother was 17 years old, my brother Ben. Uh, he was 17 when his heart failed. It was late one night. He was getting ready to go to bed. He was lying in bed talking on the phone with his girlfriend, Megan, and Megan, uh, he was talking with her when he said, my chest hurts, I can't talk anymore, and he abruptly hung up. Well, Megan called my parents who were asleep just down the hall, and she said, something's wrong with Ben, you need to go check on him. They went down the hall, my mom's a nurse, so she knew what to look for. His heart was beating 300 times per minute. They called 911, EMS showed up. The guy asked my mom, do you understand what is happening? She said yes, because they both understood him to be having a heart attack. They put him in the ambulance, rushed him to the hospital. My mom rode along in the back of the ambulance. My dad followed in the car behind. When they got to the ER, there was a team of 15 physicians and nurses waiting to help my brother. I hooked him up to an IV. A nurse was getting ready to inject some medicine. When the doctor in charge said, hold everything, don't inject that yet. Because if he has this really rare thing called Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome, if you inject that, that's going to kill him. Let's see if, he said, let's see if we can shock him, get his heart into a regular rhythm so we can run some tests. They did shock him. It did get his heart into a regular rhythm. They did run some tests, and he did indeed have Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. They did surgery the next morning when the doctor walked out into the waiting room to meet Megan and my parents and tell them surgery was successful. He said, you should be in a funeral home today. 
He said, I don't know why that doctor last night thought to check if it was this rare syndrome, but he saved your life. He saved your son's life. Because they had found just a little extra flap that wasn't supposed to be on his heart. They went up through his leg, burned it off his heart, and within a couple days, my brother walked home from the hospital and will never bother him ever again. At just the right time, Megan called my parents. At just the right time, my parents called 911. At just the right time, EMS did their job. At just the right time, a doctor said, hold on, hold on, hold on. If it's this rare thing, that'll kill him. Let's do one more test. And because a bunch of people did the right thing at just the right time, my brother's perfectly healthy today. People are going to hell. And it's not because God's an angry old man that gets a kick out of sending them there. It's that when you die, you get the full extent of what you wanted on earth. And the full extent of existence apart from God is a place called hell. And here's what I believe with all my heart. People are dying in their sin all around us. And the actions of a group of people called Mosaic at just the right time called Commitment Weekend will save their lives. Romans 5 is why we're making a commitment. I want you to take out the commitment card that was on your seat or in the seat pocket in front of you when you walked in. Go ahead, everybody take that out. Don't fill it out yet. Don't fill it out until I'm finished. If you look at the front, we're asking you to do three things. One is, if possible, make the biggest gift to Mosaic you've ever made. You can write a check or go to mosaicchristian.org slash give. Second is decide how much you want to give per month for the next 25 months. And third, some people are going to give a non-cash gift. I've heard stories of people selling boats and motorcycles. Before you fill that out, I want to show you three last scriptures. Here's the first one. We read it before. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. It is essential that if you give to this campaign, you give cheerfully. I want to tell you about somebody who's given cheerfully. One of the decisions um, some people in our church made was to involve our kids in this campaign. And not just elementary kids, but even preschool kids. So Jamie Hill of our church, who is four years old, wanted to give to this campaign, but his parents were wise. They said, well, you can't give our money. We're giving that. you got to work for it if you want to give. So they helped him set up a hot chocolate stand on a cold day in his neighborhood. His mom, Megan, took a video, put it on Instagram. I want you to listen to what Jamie said about it. Hot chocolate on a cold day. So she tagged Dave Ramsey in that. Dave Ramsey retweeted it, and over 4,500 people liked it, meaning some schmuck four-year-old got more likes in one time than I've gotten in 38 years of being alive. <laughs> That's good parenting, Jeff and Meg. And here's why I show you that. Jesus says, I'm friends with him. That's why I can say that. Jesus says, become like little children. And Jamie is having so much joy in bringing his $7 or whatever it is today. If you don't have the joy of a kid, don't give. If your spouse doesn't want you to give to this campaign, don't give. If, you feel, if you're giving out of guilt, don't give. If you're giving out of arrogance, thinking for some weird unscriptural reason that because you give money, God's going to love you more, don't give. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Scripture 2, I want to show you. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Today's a chance for you to decide where your heart's going to be. See, we want Jesus to be wrong. We want, our emo uh, we want our money to follow our emotions. But Jesus says that's not how it works. Your emotions follow your, your treasure. So this campaign is not about equal gifts. It's about equal sacrifice. Our finance team said, Carl, we looked at it and we can tell that about one-fifth of people who come to Mosaic have never given a penny to this church. 
And when you think about our mission, that makes sense because if we really are attracting people who don't go to church, I don't expect them to open their wallets on week one or even month one. But to those of you who don't give, this is a chance to jump in. This is a chance to make a huge impact on people for decades to come. And since it's not about equal gifts but equal sacrifice, don't ask, what if everyone gave what I gave? Instead, ask, what would happen if everyone sacrificed like I'm sacrificing? If you can't give much, don't feel guilty. Just give what you can. On the other hand, some of you have a lot of money. And I want to give you a warning because there is a true correlation in our church. And it it doesn't matter what religion you are, if you are religious at all, what race you are, what political party you are, it doesn't matter. This is true. In our country, the more you make, the less percentage you give. So if you're a person of means, today is a chance for you not to be a statistic. A handful of you leaders have already given to this campaign. Before you turn in your card, I want you to make sure that it truly does reflect your love for God and this place. In fact, we did an event a few weeks ago where one couple in leadership filled out a card. They wrote $2,500 on their card. A lot of money. But they emailed somebody the next morning and said, hey, listen, God wrecked us and wouldn't let us go. Please change our commitment to $10,000. Where do you want your heart to be? Several years ago, I got to go to London with a good friend of mine, Mike Winger, who's on our staff now. And we did some of the big touristy things. We were just there a couple days. One of the things we did was we visited Westminster Abbey, that famous church where there's been, you know, weddings and funerals. And there's just a ton of people buried there. You can't walk anywhere in the church without stepping where someone is buried. So we went on the tour that told you where kings were buried and queens were buried and composers, scientists, I mean, it was a who's who of people you learned about in, in high school history class. So we finished the tour. We were getting ready to walk out when I stopped in my tracks because there, right where I was getting ready to walk, was the grave of David Livingston. And I remembered the story of David Livingston. See, David Livingston lived in England in the 1800s. He tried to be a pastor, but he couldn't cut it as a pastor, so they told him to become a doctor instead. And he ended up becoming a medical missionary in Africa for the rest of his life. This was at a time where most of Europe was spending all their energy and money trying to colonize Africa. But David Livingston was in scripture, so he knew what people need isn't someone to colonize them. What they need is someone to tell them about Jesus. They don't need a ruler. They need a savior. So he went to Africa as a missionary. He fell in love with the people. The people fell in love with him. He stayed there the rest of his life telling them about Jesus. When he finally died... The people who were close to him marched his body 1,000 miles to the coast where they put it on a boat to sail for England so it could be buried. But they did kind of a gross but kind of a cool thing before they did that. They cut open his body and removed his heart because they said his body belongs to England, but his heart belongs to Africa. And Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. David Livingston had a moment of decision where he decided to go to Africa. He spent the rest of his life living out that decision, and that's where his heart was. Today is a moment of decision for you. Where is your heart going to be? Is it going to build your kingdom or God's kingdom? Will it be about you or about the lost? The reality is some of you came in today with the number you plan to commit, but before you turn in that card, please make sure you are confident that that represents a sacrifice. One couple told me early in this campaign they were going to commit $50,000 to this campaign. It's a lot. But they followed up with me a couple weeks later and said, Carl, we talked, and every time we've sacrificed, God has been faithful. So if we sacrifice more, will he not be more faithful? And they upped their commitment to $75,000. If you need to, change the number. Don't miss this moment. You won't get it back. We say around here, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Make sure your card represents your faith. Let me real quick explain the logistics of what we're going to do. When I'm done preaching, we want you to fill out the card, put it in the envelope, and then you're going to get out of your seat and put it in a bowl that will be in the baptism tub because that baptism tub represents our mission and why we're doing this whole campaign. Our guest experience team asked me to say, because there's so many people, 
We need traffic to go one way, so they're going to kind of guide you in a circle around the room this way. I know a lot of you are listening to this on our podcast, and we want you to join us by going to mosaicchristian.org slash greater and fill out an online commitment card, and then we're going to announce the total in two weeks. Before we wrap up, I have something I need to say. I want to say thank you. I had these few sentences in my notes for uh, announcement weekend, but I wanted to say today because my appreciation for you is not based on whatever you're about to write down. Uh, Thank you for being such a great church. Our campaign coach said, Carl, I got to warn you, every church we do a campaign in, the attendance goes down during the campaign. Uh, but that hadn't been true at Mosaic. Our attendance, actually, I think it's up the most of any month this entire year. Uh, the excitement you've shown has been unmatched. And this church has really taken care of my family. I am exhausted <laughs> from this campaign. I am exhausted. And I'm celebrating the end of this campaign by getting in a van tomorrow morning with six people to drive nine hours to be with family, <laughs> which wasn't my best planning, but it'll be fun once we get there. Uh, I am exhausted, but you have taken care of my family so well, especially my wife. You have brought us a ton of meals. You have sent encouraging notes. Uh, You have pampered her, given her gifts. I mean, the energy uh, given to her has just been unmatched. In fact, I was talking with her this week. She got yet another, I don't know, encouraging note or gift in the mail or something. And I was joking, you're probably going to want us to start another capital campaign in January, aren't you? And she said, well... um, But we felt your prayers, and I want to say to the volunteer team who's run this campaign and all of you who serve with them, thank you. You have endless energy. You have a humble spirit. You have dedication to this mission. And I just want you to know before you commit, I love pastoring this church. I love pastoring this church. The great joy of my life is my wife. And then next to my kids is this church. And sometimes, not even sometimes, often, all the time, other pastors ask me, Carl, how do you get a church like Mosaic? Meaning, how do you get a church with with the great people you have at Mosaic? And honestly, it's kind of like when a single person asks me, how do you get somebody like Lindsay? I look at him and I say, to get a church like Mosaic, God has to bless you. That's it. And Mosaic, I want you to know, I do not take you for granted. God has blessed me by putting you in my life, and I love this ride we're on together. So before we end, one more scripture. John 3.30, he must become greater, I must become less. We don't want the status quo. We want Jesus to become greater. The enemy of greater is just normal. People around us are living normal lives. That is why he must become greater. We need Jesus to become greater because normal isn't cutting it. If normal is marriage where you're just roommates, he must become greater. If normal is men acting like boys, being passive instead of choosing to provide and protect, he must become greater. If normal is abusing prescription drugs because you will do anything to escape the life you have, he must become greater. If normal is being defied, defined by that one person who abused you so many years ago, he must become greater. If normal is having a thousand people who follow you but zero people who know you, he must become greater. If normal is numbing the pain through alcohol or Netflix or video games or sex or drugs instead of dealing with it to experience freedom, he must become greater. If normal is generational sin not being dealt with, if normal is churches being irrelevant and judgmental, if normal is being crushed by debt, he must become greater. If normal is broken families, if normal is my past traps me in a prison of shame and fear, if normal is porn being the closest thing to true intimacy you ever get, he must become greater. If normal is me being alone and not knowing there is a community called Mosaic that says me too, he must become greater. If normal is Christians who play it safe, who when you boil it down, really the only thing they care about is their own spiritual growth while the rest of the world can go to hell, he must become greater. 
and mosaic, if normal, is people not knowing endless second chances are real, that while you are still a sinner, Christ died for you, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. He must become greater. This is why we exist. This is why people serve. This is why people invite. This is why people love Jesus, because he loves us unconditionally, and that's called grace. And our job is to let as many people know about it as we can. So Mosaic, this is your moment of decision. Spend a moment in prayer, and then when you're ready, give God your best. Let's pray. God, this is our moment of decision. God, I pray that the sinner who needs hope repents. God, I really do pray that the person who is not capable for whatever reason of giving cheerfully doesn't give and they don't feel bad about it. God, I pray that even if people came in with something preconceived, that what they write on their card represents their love for you in this place. We want to see Jesus become greater. We love you, Jesus. You have done so many special things in the nine and a half year history of this church. We'd ask that you do it again. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.